Yes, yes, this is Mr. Controversy, and this is the infamous three-point conversion station. Keep it locked. Coast to coast, representing all the dog town, especially when they win a damn game. This is the Brownstown Podcast, brought to you by the Three Point Conversion. I'm Eric, and over there is L.A. Broadus. L.A. Victory Monday. I'm loving it. I'm excited. I'm feeling it. It feels great to finally get a Victory Monday. After years of agony and pain, I want to say I think I've seen a thousand and twenty-five days or something like that since the last Victory Monday. Man, this Brown season is just—it's just magical, Eric. It really is, man. I mean, I was not expecting us to have two Victory Days in one season. I mean, we could dream, but at the same time, when you think about it. We should have had a couple victory Mondays last week and the or sorry last year and the year before. It didn't happen though, sadly. Very true, very true, man. And I'm excited about this show that we got, uh, you know, coming up, man. Um, and again, just just shock, pure shock, but not shock. I mean, look, I don't know how much my heart can take with us going (laughs) into overtime, man. Four out of five games, overtime games. This is, this is bonkers. It really is, man. But you know what? It was so worth it. And I think the fans really deserve to walk away happy from this week. Absolutely. So what did you do uh, after your, after your victory? What did, what did you get into? Well, after the victory, um, I decided to take the long way home. I decided to stop in front of a high school down the street from my house and record that interesting video that I think you alluded to. That's on my Instagram right now. Yes. (laughs) If you guys didn't see it, make sure you check it out uh, (laughs) at I am Stash Ball on Instagram. Eric has been suffering from Ebola for the last week or so, and I know you guys, if you guys heard the last episode, he was coughing all over the place and everything. And uh, he did this video and he was just excited and yelling and almost choked and coughed up a lung in the middle of it. And it was just absolutely brilliant. I mean, um, I I got a great laugh out of it. So thank you, Eric, for helping me out with that, man. Uh, I know (laughs) I know it me. I literally was in shock, but I had some yingling on tap and went to uh, polishing off some yingling, man, as, you know, to celebrate. And then also I made some buffalo chicken dip. So it was a great Sunday. I hope it was better than buffalo chicken dip I had. And the one I got from bar bar name to be withheld was not that great. It was kind of disappointing. Well, at least classy move for not naming the bar because, again, we're trying to get sponsors on here and we don't want to name drop or – you know, bash anybody. So that's well, yeah, always. I mean, the food otherwise is fan and was pretty good, but this bar name to be withheld. Good. <laughs> it, it, it needs to work on its buffalo chicken dip. I mean, it, I haven't tasted a bad buffalo chicken dip yet, but out of yeah. all the restaurants I've been to, yeah, it, you can't you can't mess that up, man. It's pretty it's pretty simple. You know, I know some people say, "Oh, I got the spe-. No, it's pretty simple. You can throw, anybody can throw it together. It's just all about how you cook the chicken to make it taste good and then how spicy you want it to be. So can't mess up buffalo chicken dip. Well, well, I thought you couldn't mess up buffalo chicken dip. I mean, I'm sure there's a – people say the same thing about pizza, but yet for some reason a bunch of chain restaurants like restaurant names to be withheld. Yeah, they find ways to do it. Tastes like crackers with cheese and ketchup on it. <laughs> all right so all right so 
anyways, uh, we're just going to, uh, here's what's on the docket for today's show. Um, we're going to be talking about analysis, uh, coming up after the break. Uh, we'll also get into a little bit of the hero and someone that seemed like Cleveland wanted to crucify at first, Greg Joseph, the MVP and scrub of the game, the rant, which I've got something cooking so, if you can't see me right now, I'm trying to do the raised eyebrow and uh, the weird... Yeah, he's still... He's got it. And then we'll wrap it up. But you are listening to the Brownstown USA Victory Formation Podcast, powered by the three-point conversion. We'll be right back. Hey, this is Gary Payton. Y'all listen to three-point conversion radio. It's the bomb. And we are back! So, let's get uh, right down into it. Let's get in it nice and dirty and deep. Get your gloves on. It's time to scrub it out. So, let's start off with probably the high point of this game, the defense. L.A., what stuck out to you, my brother? Who else? Denzel Ward, man. That that was an amazing performance by him. I know that he may come up again later on in the show on our MVP uh, scrub of the game, you know, type segment. But uh, Denzel Ward jumped out. Another th- another person that jumped out to me, well, actually just the entire way that the secondary was able to handle with Terrence Mitchell being out, that was really big because I was really concerned. And I thought, even though the Ravens were able to get off some sc- um some point, well not some points, but some scores or not even scores. What am I talking about? Yards, yards. That it is yards. Um, even though they were able to get off some yards against us, we were able to pretty much put Joe Flacco in check. I mean, he threw the ball fifty six times this game, and he had two hundred and ninety eight yards and an interception, no touchdowns or anything like that. Uh, his top receiver, Michael Crabtree, 66 yards. We held Brown in check with only 58 yards. That that w- Those were the things that we were really, really concerned about. And then can I give a shout-out to the run defense? Seriously. Because even though the running backs were able to really kind of get off some plays against us, they didn't just absolutely torch us like we've seen with the Raiders. I mean, Collins, who we were worried about because he ran all over us last week, like you alluded to in the last show, he only had 12 carries for 59 yards. Now, I will say this. I feel like he had to go out because his knee was bothering him or something was bothering him. So I think that that was huge this game because he wasn't able to come back and continue to pick up steam. You know, most running backs, they they trend. You know, you, have, mm-hmm. you hand on the ball and they get stronger. But he had to go out at one point in the game, and, I mean, it, I think it really hurt the fact of how they were able to run the ball. They only ran the ball 25 times this game compared to Joe Flacco's throwing the ball 56 times. I mean, I absolutely agree. The uh, thing is, we, I think, were also thinking about last week. We mentioned it a little bit. Alex Collins ate us alive last year. Like, the guy ran days on us, but... He didn't look the same. It might be because he was hurt, but at the same time, we also know that we can't really talk about how I mean, we really can't bring up the injury thing because that's usually one of the uh, underbellies of sports. Like, we would have won, but such and such got hurt. It's a weak argument at times, and unless it's something like a major player, a quarterback, or whatever, I don't want to hear it personally. So. Yes, sir. That's one thing. Um, the one thing that also – I mean, one of the big problems that did get exploited was the tight end situation. I mean, there were some tight end uh, catches that were – probably shouldn't stop. And, of course, John Brown did get a little bit involved, but it wasn't to the point that I think people were expecting. Like, I think people were probably expecting more. And – uh well, whatever well, the case, what? Oh, I was going to say one thing to add as well is our tackling, too. 
we're still not wrapping up the best way possible. Uh, I know I, I remember seeing and witnessing a lot of tackles that the first tackler missed. I remember Denzel Ward coming across and trying to crack somebody with his shoulder and he bounced right off of the guy. And then it was cool because he still slowed the guy up. But I mean, there was a couple of tackles that we could have had for loss and the guy bounced off of him and it, and it slowed him up so that they were able to, you know, gang tackle him. But we're still a miss. We're still missing that initial tackle too. We're, we're, we're still missing tackles. Absolutely. I mean, it's going to happen. It, this was, I mean, the problem was, I mean, that was pretty much the story of this game. I mean, we had the really good defense, but the minute that they got the ball, that we couldn't bring them down at all. It's a sad, it's a scary thing to see, but you know what? Until you can really build upon that, until you can really fix that, teams are going to take advantage of that, regard, I mean, no matter what. Especially since the game, of the, the game of football is seeing stronger players come out more and more nowadays. Very true. Very true. Uh, and we witnessed that We witnessed that with them going up against Marshawn Lynch. I mean, he was just tossing cats. So uh, we got to get better at tackling. Absolutely. So we're going to go ahead and take a short commercial break, uh, and then we'll dive right into the offense here on Brownstown, USA. Hi, I'm Rob Brazil, and I listen to the Three Part Conversion Radio. And we are back. We're we are hot like the hand of Baker Mayfield since he started in Cleveland. My God, it's like you should take this guy to Vegas with you. He's been on a roll. So that's going to segue into how do you feel about what we've been seeing from this offense lately? I like it. Again, seeing him throw that much still makes me nervous because I'm I'm waiting for the mistake. And I know that that's crazy, but, I, I mean, he's a rookie and I'm still being realistic. Threw the ball 43 times and we only rushed it 28 times. Now, I understand that the Ravens were doing a lot to bottle up our run, so a lot of the runs didn't look good at all. And that goes back on the line as far as doing better with the run blocking, which is something that we got to continue to improve on. But, you know, seeing Baker, you know, throw the ball 43 times, it's kind of crazy. Now, he did do well, though, you know, 342 yards, eight-yard average. He had um, that one interception, but then bounced back immediately. And that one interception was attested to him and the receiver not being on the same page. I believe the receiver went down the field and Baker thought he was going to cut into the middle. So Baker threw it in the middle. Um, And that's something that you're going to deal with when, you know, the way that Baker throws. Baker throws to the anticipated spot, which is what quarterbacks should do. You know, throw to the spot, not to the receiver. Um, because you're anticipating him being open, which is good. Another thing, Eric, that jumped out to me as far as receiving, um, besides the five sacks that he took, is that it looks like he likes Ninjoku a lot. Ninjoku was targeted 11 times this game, and he has six receptions. So it looks like he's zeroed in on Ninjoku. That's like his buddy, his pal, which is not, you know, crazy or anything because most quarterbacks love their tight ends so Mm -hmm. you know that that's kind of some some of the things that that I that jumped out to me I absolutely agree and something I'm starting to notice is I think the joke is getting better and better at catching the football now that Baker's in there right now I mean there was that one play that I know people were like oh that was a drop the ball was way over his head he tried to Climbed the ladder for it. I think you remember that play. It was near the sidelines. There was just no way he was going to catch that ball. It was a pretty – I mean, it wasn't a pretty ball, but he reached up. He got a hand on it, which is incredible. But he's starting to show that he can be this tight end that we were expecting last year. 
sometimes it takes about a year, a year and a half, two years to get to that level just because when you play a tight end position in college, you're not being used as the and as a main blocker. You're being used to go out and make the plays. That's kind of like what we saw yesterday on the other side of the ball is Max Williams, who, if you remember, he was a first-round pick as well, I believe, out of Minnesota. And not he didn't play terribly, but it looks like he's been having some problems trying to get used to the NFL style. Um, Landry, of course, has been a safety valve as well. Rashard Higgins, before the injury, my God, he was, you know, he's getting more and more involved. He's stepping into that Josh Gordon role. Hollywood is starting to look golden right now. I mean, the injury update is that he's week to week. We'll get to that a little bit later. But you know exactly who I'm going to talk about right now, though. The kid that's like the RKO. Out of nowhere, Willies. Where did he come from? We remember him in the preseason being okay, but he played a huge role yesterday. He did. He did. And I I think a lot of people pegged, instead of Willies, they were thinking that maybe Damian Ratley would have took that spot and maybe showed up and did some things, but they had Ratley inactive this game. Um. Willie's really showed up, and um, I remember I was I was watching some press presser from yesterday. I think it was Jarvis, and um, I put like a comment on there, like, "Yeah, man, I love Willie's," and I was like, "Wait, hold on, I can't say that like that." So, um, <laughs> it was kind of crazy uh, to be able to just witness him come in with how close the game was, how pressure packed it was and you know just being able to step up get those three receptions big big yardage plays too uh and I mean I couldn't be more impressed and then Rashard Higgins of course you know I picked him I picked him on our last show to have a big game and I mean it looked like my my prediction was going to come true yet you know we see him go down for the injury and like you said we'll get into more details of that a little bit later but I want to ask you this really quickly uh, about the offense are you satisfied with still with how they use Duke this game you know it was nice to see them use Duke a little bit more I mean he got he had five carries for 35 yards but he also was able to have one reception for seven yards my thing is this I think maybe it might be time to start using him in more screens. But, like, I will say this. I'm glad that they're using him more for the, his regular roles and less in plays that we saw with, like, Rod Streeter, for example, who that play was not going anywhere. It, yeah. I don't know why we keep trying to run plays like that. I mean, I get it. It's to trick the defense. But we haven't been – the only time that's ever worked – was the Philly Philly, whatever we're calling it, special with Baker Mayfield. We don't go for the trick play so early in the game. I mean, it's really starting to uh, lose its luster. Um, I don't even know why they would do it for Rod Streeter anyway. Like, I, I, I didn't really picture a Rod, Rod Streeter as being a guy that could successfully do, like, a sweet play. You know, to me, he doesn't jump out and say burner. So I don't even know why they would give it to Rod Streeter. But the the reason why I brought that up is because Duke still didn't get the touches that I like him to see. I'm tired of them throwing him in there in third and, like, 15 and saying, hey, guy, get me 20 yards out of this play, even though you haven't played all game. Or, you know, throwing him in and splitting them out, and then they, they automatically know that it's going to be a passing play. So – of course, Jarvis or Njoku or somebody else is going to be open before Baker looks at Duke because Duke is not normally in the game. He doesn't know Duke like that. And then another person that we've seen suffer from this dude is Nick Chubb. Nick Chubb only got three carries. So it's like he went from hero to now not doing anything. Absolutely. I mean, here's the thing. I think at this point, you ha- I mean, Hugh's got to make some kind of decision because – 
Nick Chubb and Carlos – well, mainly Nick Chubb is the future running back of this team. We don't know how much uh, Carlos Hyde is going to be here because if we're going to have, like, that inconsistencies like what we've seen where he gets such and such and such and such, then we could see Hyde longer. If we see, like, what we saw last week with Chubb, he could be here shorter. There is in between – there is – that weird in between where it's like I don't know, but I think it's time to make a decision. Do you want him put? I mean, we can keep Duke, but make him a wide receiver. Make him a t- make him a running back. Just make him something. Make a decision. And have him do something. Is all I'm saying. Yeah, no, I I completely agree. Um, another thing too before we move on is I want to get your opinion on um, the Baker the Baker sacks. We've seen Baker get sacked five times this game. We knew that the Ravens would be pretty tough as far as their line, you know, Terrell Suggs. Mm-hmm. We, kn- we knew that they were going to be tough, actually, like, to go down and drill down. Let's see, Weddle had a sack, and that one was, like, completely just wide open. He just came right in and just s- smacked the crap out of Baker. Uh, we had Suggs finally actually got one as far as a sack as well. Mm-hmm. Are you concerned with the fact of Baker getting these sacks? I mean, because we've seen him – we've seen how tough he is to bring him down. Um, and, you know, he, he kind of does these spin moves and he's, like, real slippery and stuff like that. I don't know. Is, is it just me or am I the only one that gets kind of nervous, man, when I'm seeing him do that crap? What, when he does the spinning? The spinning, the little waggle moves, you know, the one time he, he almost broke through, but he, he slipped and fell, you know, anyway. Like, it's like I get nervous, man, because I kind of see, like, this backyard football kind of thing. And, you know, I, I guess I just want him to look a little bit more smoother when he does stuff like that. I mean, I could see it a little bit. It was a very uh, – it's very hard to watch just because – People do see this type of stuff, um, and they have seen other quarterbacks do stuff like this. Randall Cunningham, if you remember him back in the day, he was kind of slippery. Steve McNair, I'm not saying that they're players that you should model your game after, but, you know, it's something to definitely watch for. Now, the problem with Baker in this situation is, the, I actually don't put a lot of the sacks that he had, that he ate, on him. A lot of them came from weird blitzes. I mean, look, I mean, just going down the line, Wells a safety. Young, who had half a sack, is a safety. Uh, let's see. Brandon Williams, I believe it is. Okay, was a lineman. There wasn't that many front seven sacks when you get down to it. They were sending the house on a few of them. So the thing is, they need to – one thing that if Cleveland wants to do this, they got to keep a running back back there or keep one of the tight ends in the block. I mean, that's why we brought in Fells. And you know what? You got to keep – if you can't block them with the regular five, you got to put somebody in there because – Terrell Suggs and Eric Weddle are all pro talents. It doesn't matter how old they are. They are freaking monsters, and they will eat you alive. Uh, But that's the thing. We have to realize that they're going to send the blitz. One thing I will say, though, it could be a lot worse. If it was Taylor back there, I think they would have had double-digit sacks on us. Yeah, I mean – Again, I, I'm not speaking – I mean, yeah. Tyrod is Tyrod. But I think, too, as far as the blisses and stuff that they were sending, yeah, great job. But I'm not going to completely exonerate Baker because these are the things that he has to be able to pick up on. A veteran quarterback will be able to see the blitz coming or they'll be able to recognize maybe the coverage and be able to, say, switch the play to a run or something like that. or you know, get, you know, get a quick screen or something. I mean, something he, this is, this is going to be definitely a learning experience. The thing that I love so much about Baker is that he's a student at a game 
so you already know that this film, he's going to be just absolutely digesting every single minute of it. And I'm going to be like, okay, this is what this coverage looks like. All right, I got sacked on this one. All right, this is what I need to see here. And another thing, too, is with the offensive line, I think that they're going to learn from this film as well and see, like, okay, you know, and, you know, shout out to shout out to the rookie again, Harrison, who held his own. Uh, just absolutely impressive to see this young man grow in front of our eyes. And it, and it's so quickly, you know, I might add, like you, you just don't anticipate, you don't anticipate a left tackle undrafted rookie. I mean, that's like one of, that's the most important position on the line is the left tackle position and undrafted rookie just coming in, man. What a, what a gym, Eric, what a gym that we got right there. Absolutely. And it's funny because, there were still people that are complaining about this kid at times, but you know what? For what we got, I think that maybe this is a diamond in the rough that should definitely be poli- – that's going to take some polishing, but you know what? He's showing more than what we saw with Batonio during the preseason. He's showing more than what we have and what we've had. Now – the one guy that someone pointed out to me that did look like he was struggling a bit was J.C. Treader at times, which I could see it a little bit. I mean, I think part of the thing with Treader was he was supposed to be, as much as we hate this word, a bridge center because we brought him in. I think we had it in our heads that we were going to draft somebody at some point to take over for him. So we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, that may be something that they address, um, especially in a draft. You know, linemen has been kind of scarce these last couple of years anyway in the draft. They've been going lower than anticipated. Well, not anticipated because we anticipated it, but lower than what we've seen in the previous years where you would see, you know, offensive tackles and, you know, all these high, you know, linemen getting drafted, you know, in the first second, third, you know, overall draft pick. So we haven't really had drafts like that where it was that strong. And then also everybody's put so much, you know, put so much just stock in these in these quarterbacks, which we, you know, it's crazy because at first leading up to the draft, which is probably the most painful thing ever, is going through all that draft coverage for forever until the actual draft. But – before, you know, we were thinking like, oh, you know, this draft, we, you know, there's not going to be any top quarterbacks or they should be maybe, you know, mid-rounders. Then all of a sudden we see all these trades, book it, you know, do going number one overall, second overall, and then it just goes from there. So I think now with the with the league now getting flooded with quarterbacks, there's not really many teams out there that you see and say, oh, they need a quarterback now compared to the year prior unless there's a major injury. Now the quarterbacks are kind of, you know, filling in and they've got their spots on their certain teams. So now I think you'll start to see the draft change a little bit more where you'll see people going for these defensive guys or you may see it go back to linemen again. Absolutely. I mean, that's just what it is. That's just how it happens. It always has been that way. I mean, keep in mind, it was only like – it wasn't until a few years ago where we saw – really linemen going in the top 10 like not just offensive but defensive as well um it wasn't until maybe two or three years ago that we started seeing safeties and cornerbacks but anyways we'll just stop it there for now uh when we come back we'll talk about the miracle man greg joseph coming up here on the brownstown usa post game show and victory formation Woo-hoo! three point conversion stay tuned Ladies and gentlemen, this is Cat Williams, and you are listening to Three Point Conversion Radio. And we are back! Well, probably one of the biggest, probably the heart attack waiting to happen this past week was Greg Joseph, the young kicker that the Cleveland Browns brought in. They decided to take him over Cairo Santos, Blair Walsh, and so many other big names. The only big name not being mentioned was uh, Dan Bailey, but that's because he didn't want to come here. 
But Greg Joseph comes in. I believe he missed one regular field goal and then one PAT. But L.A., do you feel comfortable with Greg Joseph? No, I do not feel comfortable with him. Is he feasible? Is he palatable? Yes, he is. He seems like a great kid. I get it. You know, Zane did what he did, and it put a lot of pressure on that position. So for him to be a rookie coming into a situation like this, a team that is starving for wins, and then we are going into overtime every single time, and he's probably, like, crapping his pants, like, man, come on, man, another one? Can't y'all just throw a touchdown or something and be, you know, and and let it be over with that way? Like, I, I mean, you know, it's a lot of pressure. And But just looking at this kid, watching this presser, watching him interact with the teammates in the locker room, uh, that video that we put up in Brownstown, USA on Facebook, it, it's, it's, it's very fun. It's very fun, and, I, and I'm, I'm rooting for the guy. But the way he kicks is just so weird, man. It's like a weird knuckleball. And then the crazy part, man, is that even Hugh Jackson was questioned this morning on his, on his um, conference call. and. You know, Hugh Jackson was said, and I quote, on the winning field goal, I don't look at it as a break, but it went through. Then he was asked if the team would look for a new kicker, and Hugh said right now he's our kicker until he's not. So it's kind of like Greg Joseph kind of had to come in, and he's he's earning he's earning his trust, but it's still not there yet. It's like creeping a little bit by little bit because it, it just looks weird. I know somebody got a hand on that last field goal, but – it still looks weird when he kicks it. Even that first game he came in and kicked for us. You remember we were just like, oh, my God, did he miss it? Did he Did he make it? We don't know yet. We're looking at the officials like – and they're looking at each other like, did it go through? So that, that's where I stand on Greg, man. You know, watching Greg Joseph, you could tell that this kid is having a lot of fun. He's happy to be here, but holy crap. Right. Every time he kicks it, I feel like – I need somebody with CPR to be ready to go because, one, the ball's either moving around like a knuckleball, like you said, or it's hooking, which it's like, don't hook, don't hook. Now, I made a post yesterday about how when he missed the two field goals, it was rest in peace his career in Cleveland. And a lot of people – We're on the fence a little bit. Some were like, not yet, maybe. There was one person that was a little bit adamant about it and was calling me out on it when I just said, after what we saw with Zayn Gonzalez uh, the past year and a half, where the minute that fans wanted him gone, he started doing well. (laughs) I don't think it's that bad to say. I like the kid, honestly. I think he's a joy to watch. Is he the ultimate answer, though? I don't know at this point. He needs to work on getting those kicks better. The one thing I will say is he had a better day than Mason Crosby. Yeah. that Wow. That right there. <laughs> that, that, was, that, was, that was ridiculous. How I many kicks did he, he – did Mason miss? He missed like – He missed four five, regular four. field goals and then an extra point. We were a total of 13 points. And this is a guy that's supposedly one of the top five kickers in the league. He's been a top five kicker in the league. He's usually one of the first kickers to go in fancy football. Yeah, and the crazy part, though, is we've seen it from him before in his career. So it's really going to be puzzling to see what the Packers do because they stuck with him before when it happened earlier in his career, and then, you know, and then he bounced back. So I don't know if the heat from all the other kickers in the league because – I don't know if you notice this trend, Eric, is that most teams now are going into overtime. Like, it's like this year has been bananas with the amount of overtimes or close games that's been happening, which speaks to the NFL that it's, it's evening out, right? You know, teams are competing. every It's any given Sunday, really, this year that we've seen. Um, so with the emphasis being on overtime and close games, the the – the kicker job isn't just the breeze anymore. It's not just the, you know, you come in and maybe kick an extra point or whatever. It's not like that anymore. They're depending on you 
and I think I heard Hugh Jackson say this in the, in, the, in this press conference as well after the game, or it was somebody else. It wasn't Hugh Jackson, I'm sorry. But these kickers are being dependent on to not only win games, but to also save jobs, okay? Because that loss can get people fired. You know what I mean? So it's like it's, it's even more important on kickers now. Absolutely. I mean, follow the biggest example, who I and mean, can you tell me uh, – who lost their job, and I believe it was 2015 or 2016, when the Browns beat them because of the kicker. Do you, ever, do you remember the name Mike McCoy? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about because, I mean, it's not like it's that many wins that we had. So No, yeah, I mean, the thing is, Mike McCoy was looking like a promising head coach, struggled, but I think it was the Browns game that broke the levy on it, so... It's a weird thing, but kickers nowadays are being considered the lifeline of the football I and mean, in football, especially now that the field goals are back a little bit de- and a little bit back farther. That the re- that they're being asked to do more. Like, I'll be honest, I did not feel comfortable at all with uh, Joseph trying to kick that fifty-five yarder. Right. I mean, yeah. And- that was that, that was crazy. Like I. I mean, I was hoping that he made it, of course. Oh, yeah. But, but you, you kind of just knew. You're just like, dang, man, you just going to throw him in there for the 55-yarder? Yeah, I mean, okay. and the thing is, there was still a little bit of time left on the clock that he could have at least tried maybe one more quick play to get him a little closer, I feel. But I, was, it on, was it already fourth down or was it? Yeah, it was already fourth down. Okay, never mind then. I take that back if it was – if it was, I mean, I feel like in any case, something's got to be looked at there. Uh, the interesting thing is, you said that we brought in a kicker last week that was able to kick over. I mean, I was kicking over fifty yards. Do the Browns go dual kicker now? Um, you you said in the draft? No, no. Uh, during the uh, I mean, last week, you said that uh, they brought in a guy that went eight for ten. But was kicking from over fifty yards. Um, it was either last week or two weeks ago. Um, I can't remember what his name was exactly. Uh, let me see if I can find it really quick. But there's a guy that was brought in because they felt. I thought for some reason. Uh, let me see. What was his name? I remember. I and mean, uh, we brought him in because for some reason, Dorsey. Uh, here it is. Uh, Miles Bergner completed a great workout with the Browns, saying that he hit eight of ten with a long of a fifty-seven yarder from SD Coyotes. Nice. Really, I'm not for nothing. But are we? Where are we? Why are we picking such weird places and? Because we got we got South Africa and now we're looking at South Dakota. So when are we gonna bring in that Montana long snapper? Hey, look, man. To be honest with you, those small schools and stuff they produce kickers. Oh, I mean, they it, do. They really do. <laughs> so having the kickers, you can't even like tie them to like a big Division One school. So I mean, it, it really doesn't even. I mean, big Division One schools, if you think about it, the way they play and, and, and do stuff, I mean, it, it doesn't really rely on the kickers that often, even though, yeah, there has been some games where the, the kick has been relied on. But, I mean, it really doesn't – it doesn't matter. So, you know, you can get one from, uh, you know, um, Alaska University or, you know, from, you know, somewhere Timbuktu. So, you know. It it could go either way. Absolutely. So we're going to take a break. Then we'll get to MVP and scrub of the game. We'll get to the rant coming up a little bit later on. And then in the wrap-up, we'll talk about some of the injuries. And we'll talk about some of the crazy free agent news coming up in the wrap-up. But stay tuned. We're going to give out some game balls. And we're going to uh, give away some towels for uh, the uh, young scrub who Bring to the washroom. This is the Brownstown Podcast, powered by the three point conversion. A 37 yard attempt to win the game for Cleveland. Joseph's kick on the way, and it is good! It went in, and the Browns win in overtime! Oh. 
And we're back. So we. Oh yeah. What? Victory Monday. Oh yeah. Victory Monday. Punching pie. Uh, so. Punching pie. pie. Oh my god. So there were a lot of people that were deserving of MVP, and a couple people deserving of scrub. L.A. Floor is yours. Who do you take for MVP? <laughs> Can I deny him? I mean, I can't deny it. <laughs> like, there's just no way I can deny this kid the MVP. Even though, crazy enough, when you look at that Hugh Jackson speech when he was handing out game balls, he did not get a game ball. What? No. Hugh Jackson gave right. the game ball. He gave the game ball to Den- um to um Greg Joseph, to Baker Mayfield, and to John Dorsey. So, because he didn't get the game ball, I'm gonna give it to. Denzel Ward, of course. This guy was able to come in, block a huge field goal, also get an interception in the red zone. Two humongous plays that could have relayed to points and had a, and we we probably would have lost the game. So I cannot deny giving him the game ball. Those are just some humongous, huge plays. And I can again just speak to the uh, of the awesomeness of this guy. And him being a rookie, man, I mean, remember, we were bashed. We were bashed for passing up Chubb, you know. And, you know, we were bashed again for picking Baker over Barkley, which I'm not going to say Barkley isn't a good player because he had an amazing Sunday, by the way. I don't know if you caught the oh, play. We, oh, absolutely. Trust me. I was, I was with my buddy who's a Giants fan, and we were surrounded by Giants fans at restaurant name to be withheld. and. I'll be honest, if you thought we had an up-and-down game, the fact that Graham Gano had to hit a 63-yarder to win it for the Panthers when they were like, yeah, there's no way this is going to happen. There's no way this is – it happened. Are you kidding me? But you know what? That's beside the point. Denzel Ward is definitely a very, very, very good pick for that. I'm actually going to go ahead and go to the other side of the ball, believe it or not. The one guy that I think, in my opinion, does get the game ball, and this is going to sound strange just because this guy hasn't been the same since he really the the Ricardo Lewis injury. I'm going to say Rashard Higgins for this one. I mean, he's been showing up game after game, but – the boy finally got a touchdown. He finally helped himself instead of just getting it close enough. Landry's close because of that one catch, but there were some issues that I did have with him a little bit. Landry's looking good right now. Don't get me wrong. 69 yards. Rob Gronkowski's favorite amount of yards to get in a game. But the fact of the matter is, Higgins, if it wasn't for that touchdown, we might not be celebrating today. Absolutely, and it was a butte. It was an absolute butte. Absolute butte, and you know what? It was a beautiful pass from him to Baker, so got to give credit where credit's due. I will give an honorable mention also to, to Jabril Peppers. There was you know one, what? You're right. God darn it. You're right. I mean, there were, I mean let me be honest. That play should have been a touchdown. That last play by the Ravens. Most weeks of the year, that probably would have been a touchdown. Jabril Peppers playing pissed off, playing like his city was starting to turn on him a little bit, goes out, breaks it up, and I have never seen a stadium erupt that loudly. But you know what? The other – and let me give you one other thing. I don't know if you mentioned it for Ward. He blocked Justin Tucker. Oh, Who yeah, does yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah. while I try to get my voice back, scrub of the game. Go. Scrubby, scrub, scrub a dub. Well, to be honest with you, my scrubbity, scrub, scrub of the game shall be. Mm-mm. I'm going to actually go with Chubb. I know. I'm sorry, guys. I, I, I apologize. <laughs> but I'm going to go with Chubb, and that's because 
if we can give him praise for having a breakout game, we also have to be tough on him when he has a bad game. And he registered three carries for two yards. Not good at all. And th- that's the thing about Chubb is that, you know, we always pick out his blocking and stuff like that as far as the reason why he's not getting on the field. But at the same time, he has been indecisive a lot in his runs too. And that's just about him trying to find his running style. I don't know if you notice, uh, Eric, but with Carlos Hyde, he does like a little hop step before he like hits a, hits a hole. Yeah, yeah. I think that's like his groove, his thing that he does. So I, I'm not saying Chubb needs to get a little hop step or anything, but Chubb just needs to be a little bit more decisive. And again, it's against a tough Ravens defense. But again, if I got if I can give the guy praise like I did last week or how we did last week, then I also need to be able to be tough on him as well when he doesn't do that well. I could hear I could believe that. I could definitely believe that. Um you know what? For me it's actually a tie this week. Oh so Nick Chubb for obvious reasons. I mean, you pretty much said it perfectly. If you if you can praise the guy then you cra- then you crown him. But when he does struggle, you have to uh, be able to say he struggled. The other guy I'm going to bring up, and this is probably going to get some major heat from the fans, Larry Ugenjobi. What? Larry Ugenjobi did not show up at all yesterday. He had three quarterback hits, man. He, he yeah, three held quarterback out hits. He didn't have it, and he didn't register a single tackle, though. That's because they were going to the inside. Look, That's not his fault. Get off of Ogunjobi. Yes, but how many times – I did see also – didn't he get penalized quite a few times as well with face to the – I mean, hands to the face? Look, I, I mean, my, it's exactly that. It's great to see him getting to the quarterback. It really is. But at the same time – if we can crown, I and mean, if we're gonna crown uh, what I mean, Chubb for being a gr- for having that great game, Ugin Joby's had two really good weeks, and has had a few really good weeks. I'm not gonna take away from that, but at the same time, we gotta hold the players to a standard. There, he had a bad week. He'll he'll shake it off. He's a true professional, but you know what? We had a bad day. They get all die. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to get that song out of my head, you son of a. <laughs> Here, I, I qu- trivia. Can you name who sang the song? No. Daniel Powder. It was used on American Idol whenever uh, that happened, I and mean, whenever someone got eliminated. That's your trivia fact of the day by some boop, crazy boop. white guy that had one hit and sucked. Boop boop. Yep. All right. So, he, I mean, but anyways, bad days, they happen, they suck. We will call you out on them. Because in addition to being a good I and mean, being a good podcast, we're also D bags sometimes. That's true. Anyways, we'll go ahead I and mean, we're gonna take another break and then I'll wind it up and throw it away. The rant. And I cannot wait to see the reaction that's going to come from this gentleman. We'll be right back. Hey, I'm Diana Taurasi from the Phoenix Mercury, and you're listening to the Three Point Conversion Radio. And we are back. Brownstown, USA, in victory formation. Victory Monday. Oh! Yes. So, we just got done wrapping up our MVP and scrub of the game. And what you've been waiting for, we're going to throw it to Eric for his rant of this week. Now, as we build this up, if you haven't heard before, Either me or Eric will do a one-minute rant where we just go to town about something that we've seen that is bothering us. So, in this week's rant, Eric will get the floor. I am ready with my timer. Eric, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. In five, four, three, two, one. You know, 
all this week, the talk was about how bad the refs screwed us last week against the Raiders. And I could get behind that. That was initially going to be my rant this week. Until I noticed a sign going after Jabril Peppers. You know what? This is why players don't sign in Cleveland. This is why they walk away. This is why players like Tashawn Gibson, when they do get released, when they do get cut, never have anything great to say about the city. This is why I would not be surprised in three years if when Jabril Peppers actually looks like a good safety, if he's like, you know what? I remember what you said about us. I'm out. Uh, guys, stop pissing off the players. Let them play. Let them do their thing because they're looking good. Let them be. And that is your rant of the day. Do, 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 do. Anywho. Yeah, that was like the Power Rangers theme song. My bad. Anywho, well, Eric, I absolutely agree with you. When I seen that, I just shook my head. I actually seen from a couple of bigger Browns pages that, like, posted and said, you know, Jabril Peppers, da-da-da. And I know we really dove deep into that last episode with Jabril Peppers versus the fans um, when we were doing our preview. But there were actually people in these comments talking about, well, you know, well, he just needs to play better and shut up and all this other stuff. And I'm like, dude, you guys still do not get it at all. I mean, how how are you going to sit up here and sit and justify approaching a guy when he's out trying to get some freaking deodorant at a drugstore? How are you going to be holding up these posters, daggone degrading him, and he plays for your team, but then at the same token wish and hope that he gets you a win? That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. You hold up posters, you make posters, and you do that for the team across the way. You don't do that for our own people. That is crazy. It's asinine. And it just really makes me sick, man. I really had to hold back my Twitter fingers. I had to hold back my Facebook fingers being a keyboard warrior here because I really wanted to go in on some of these fans, man. It's just stupid. I mean – the fact is, we can't just keep going back and forth about how this guy's a terrible player. Because it's not just him as well. How many times did people poo-poo on David Njoku? Like, he'll go out there and have, like, one drop and, oh, look at that, he dropped, he's dropping too many times. He dropped the ball once. And yet they're like, oh, but Callaway's look good and they'll have like three drops. At least be consistent. I mean, look, the thing is, Peppers has been a much better player on defense this year. Special teams is a different subject. I hold him to a different standard for that just because he shouldn't be returning kicks anymore. But you know what? Whatever. You know, and you're, you're absolutely right, man. And and you know what? And that's okay, guys, because you guys have started to subscribe to the show. You guys are following the show, and we definitely appreciate the, the love and the listens that we've gotten this far. And it's okay, guys. We will break down and give you the players that you should be booing or who you should – whatever you want to do. Because the way that you did describe, Eric, is that a lot of fans are out there, and they're kind of fair-weather fans. You know, they don't really dive into the analysis. They just go off of what they see or what they hear or, you know, what plays on a highlight or something like that. So, you know what? Don't fret, guys. Do not fret because L.A. and Eric are here to help you out to get you right. Well, here it is. Uh, what do you call it? Pro, fo- and Pro Football Focus just uh, gave their grades for uh, the highest graded players on defense for this past week. You ready for this? I'm ready. Number five, Denzel Ward with a 71.2. Now, he did have some major moments, so that's a pass. Number four, Smith. Chris Smith, I guess, uh, with a 74.9. Don't remember him doing much, but whatever, I do, I would believe it. Number three, EJ Gaines at a 77.3. Number two, 
Joe Schobert with an 86.0. And the reason I bring this up now, number one, Jabril Peppers with an 87.0. But yet, he's the one that's getting crapped on because he needs to play better and stop whining. Unbelievable. That, that is true. That is very, very true. And again, Peppers, the thing is this, okay? A lot of people judge players off of the amount of big plays they're able to do, interceptions, block field goals, whatever, what have you. And that's cool. And I'm glad that Ward is doing what he is doing because, mm-hmm. yeah, he looks like the flashy, the more flashy player, right? But at the same time, people don't understand that things go into this defensive scheme, okay? If you have a reliable player at his position that you know can hold down that side of the field like Peppers, then guess what? That allows Greg Williams to be able to blitz. That allows Greg Williams to be able to bring up Jabril. Like on one play, I remember him coming up and actually clogging the hole for the guy that was trying to run inside and cut it inside but Jabril was there to stop that. So the guy had to bounce to the outside and yeah, Miles Garrett, or I believe somebody else was able to get the tackle, but people aren't looking at the uh, impact of what it, it, it is and what it means to be able to have a guy out there and be able to hold it down, whether it's him blitzing or whether it's him covering. So the co- quarterback has to throw to the other side of the field, or maybe the quarterback has to hold it a little bit longer because Jabril has covered the guy. So now the quarterback gets sacked. There's a lot of things behind this. So before we automatically judge or have these quick trigger reactions to a guy, we need to be able to, how Hugh Jackson says, look at the tape. Absolutely. I mean, the thing is, uh, we really need to understand that there's more to it than what we do see. I mean, look, just because somebody doesn't lead the league in interceptions – does not mean that they're not covering somebody. I mean, one of the things is, and this is a crazy thing to say, how many people remember some of the other quarterbacks that we've had? Not many, because they all remember the one cornerback we had because he was flashy as hell. And you remember, and you know exactly who I'm talking about here. He plays for the Pittsburgh Steelers now, Joe Hayden. I would not. Say his name. People forget that Buster's screen was effective for us against slot receivers. It wasn't the best when it came to playing on the outside, but he was effective in the slot. But he didn't put up a lot of the interception, so he wasn't that good. Right. Or how about or when we had Sheldon Brown? Same thing. Joe Hayden making all the interceptions. Sheldon Brown is being an anchor on the defense. So, yeah. The thing is, watching the game, let me be honest with you, j- making judgments based on watching the game is overrated at this point because your eyes are going to lie to you. There were already people that were pegging Miles Garrett last year to be a bust because he didn't do – and he didn't get that many sacks. You have to understand it in the context of what's going on, though. And as fans, we can't do that. And you know what? We're going to get to the wrap-up. Coming up after this, this is Brown Sound USA, powered by the three-point conversion. Please enjoy this nice break. Let's see what Damien's trying to sell us this week. What up, sports fans? It's your boy Damien Adams from The Real Deal with Damien Adams. Now, you can catch my show Weekly here on the Three Point Conversion Station. I'm always bringing that real sports talk for the real sports fan. But if you're hearing my voice right now, that means you're living life correctly. Because you're listening to Brownstown with my man L.A. and Eric. Make sure you stay tuned. Tell your friends about the show. Because you know they're bringing that real for you. That knowledge for you here on Brownstown. And we are back. And in this wrap up, we've got news that's coming out for today. We've got injury updates. So let's get down to it. Let's send it over to our correspondent, L.A. Bratis, who literally breaks everything. 
Hello there, Eric, and uh, hello there, Brownstown, USA. I am here at First Energy Stadium right now reporting that, yes, Richard Higgins, we've seen him leave the game, and um, it has been breaking down and been told to us that he has an MCL strain, and he will be sidelined for at least two to three weeks. Now, he will not require any surgery, so it looks like he'll just be rehabbing it, which is a great sign for us. Richard, this past game, had a touchdown reception, the only score in the game, and it was very huge. So seeing him go down is definitely a major blow to the Cleveland Browns. Also, Eric, we have some breaking news here coming through that coming out of Miami, the Miami Dolphins seem to be disgruntled with wide receiver Devontae Parker, and they are looking and have been involved in discussions to trade him. Back to you. Well, that's a very interesting situation going on right now. I mean, if I may, the uh, Rashard Higgins thing is huge when you get down to it. Rashard Higgins has been having somewhat of a revitalization, and to lose him would be huge, especially if everything that we're seeing with Ricardo Lewis on the bike, working out again, all that is leading to something. Now, the Devontae Parker thing, I've been seeing mixed reports about it, as I've been seeing mixed reports about it, but I don't know if I want the guy. I'll be honest with you. He's not a bad receiver, but he hasn't panned out to the level that I think people were expecting. Good receiver, but I know, and but everyone knows that this guy's mother kind of got him in a little bit of trouble. And I see you giving me the look. Okay. So, yeah. So his mom didn't want him to play in Cleveland. We get that. I, yeah, whatever. Water under bridge. Mm-hmm. He's been in the league for three to four years now. I, I get it. Nobody wanted to play for Cleveland. I don't care about that. This is a different team, different regime. The arrow is looking up and pointing up. The thing of, and the reason why I want Devontae is because – Devontae is 6'3", 6'4". He runs about a 4'4", 40. And he has flashes. He's still young. He's still in his rookie deal. He has two more years left on his rookie deal, including a fifth-year option. So, and his, and his cap hit is not that high. I believe his cap hit, when I was looking it up, was around $2 million this year. Then it'll go to about $9 million next year. Plenty of room for us to operate and work with him. He also was partnered with Jarvis Landry in Miami. So if anybody would know Devontae and know what kind of caliber player he is, Jarvis would know. So I'm pretty sure that they will involve Jarvis and talk to him and ask him, hey, how's Devontae? If Jarvis signs off on it and gives his blessing, then I'm cool with it. Because I know that when Devontae comes into this wide receiver room, it's going to be contagious. We already know. It's going to be contagious. So with, with Devontae's speed, with his size, I really, really feel, and I know that this may hurt other people in the wide receiver room because I've seen that Mary Kay just reported that, um, you know, just like how we said that Higgins may be out two to four weeks, but even with Browns working out Rashard Matthews today, they were leaning towards staying in-house with the receivers, so meaning that they probably were very impressed with uh, what, what Willie's did, and they may be looking at, um, at Ratley. But if you can get a Devontae Parker – which I'm thinking we got Jarvis for, what, a fourth? Yeah. So I think that Devontae, we can probably get him for a, 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 at least a sixth-round draft pick at, at this point. Um, we've seen what Miami, what they've been doing with their receivers. I'm not counting his production straight to that. Their quarterback position has been off as well. I mean, we've seen them have Tannehill go down, bring in Jay Cutler. Miami hasn't been the most stable organization in the last few years, so I'm not going to just – throw him away just because of his last couple years of production. Again, he's still in his rookie deal. He's 24 years old. We can we can make this work if we want to. Absolutely. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I think at this point, Cleveland is going to make some kind of move. I mean, Des Bryant had the weird tweet. I don't count Des Bryant in this conversation though right now. No, I no, think I, my, my ship is sold. My ship has sailed on Des Bryant. Exactly. I mean, 
it's a, is it a possibility? Unfortunately, everything's a possibility at this point. But the thing is, those odds are so low that if you were to bet maybe $1 in Vegas right now, you'd probably be a millionaire if he came back and signed with Cleveland. Ooh. I'm not saying go gamble right now. I'm just saying. Dang it. I was about to say, I'm looking at a dollar right now. That's just what I need. <laughs> Trust me, <laughs> if you need that kind of money, I I'm don't want to know what you've been spending it on. But anyways, um, but given that we had that, given the news earlier this week that Richard Matthews was working out in Cleveland today, I don't know what's going on with that, but there's some people that are speculating – mainly Dog Pound Daily, saying that maybe his odds of signing here just went up, especially given that Arizona, mm, not really a great alternative right now. Just right now, anyways, especially if Rashard probably wants a one-year deal at this point. I really don't – I don't like Rashard. I mean, after looking looking at – the uh his his stats looking at you know his height he's he's only six foot he runs like a four six forty I really don't feel like he can make a tremendous impact in this organization I, I'm just being honest with you no yeah but I'm just saying that I do think that a move is coming whether it's going to be him whether it's they find a way to go out and get Devonte Parker or the weirder one could be the name that no one's being thrown that no one's throwing out a rumor that has been building some steam and gotten some legs that of Tarod Taylor for a fifth or six, which has been floated around. It's weird, but now's the time that's probably going to happen because well, Tannehill hasn't been consistent we haven't seen I and mean, we've seen what's going on in uh what do you call it we've seen what's going on in San Francisco Bethard hasn't looked bad but at the same time he hasn't looked like the Bethard that people were expecting from last year I, I you know what real quick man you know and then I'll pass it back to you I, yeah. I don't I don't like the idea of Tyrod getting traded I mean to to be honest with you yeah he probably isn't happy to the fact that he lost the starting job, but he doesn't seem like the kind of guy that is just going to cause a ruckus in the locker room. Like he, he doesn't seem like that kind of guy. He, he'll just stay quiet and he'll do what was required of him. You know, we got to remember he, he leaves after this year anyway, you know, his contract is up. So I would much rather have Tyrod as a backup with him being here all preseason, all training camp, and can step in and know what's going on over Drew Stanton because I still think he has more talent than Drew Stanton. And I would rather him be here than to trade him off for like a fifth or a sixth and then bring in some guy off the street unless unless we're talking about bringing back Brogan. But then – you're you're kind of scared because you're just like, man, dang, if Baker goes down, like, holy crap, the talent level just drops tremendously. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's the crazy thing about all this, especially given that you know that the fans are going to clamor for Cleveland to sign a certain quarterback from the preseason. And I just wouldn't do that right now at this point. It would not be in our best interest. But – They're still going to complain about it. They're still going to call for it. There's nothing we can do except try to keep a level head with this. But you know what? That's where we're going to leave it off for today. Uh, We we had a good show, and you know what? It just makes going into this week going to be all the more interesting because next up is the Chargers. Those Chargers. in Cleveland, and we all remember what happened the last time that the Chargers were in Cleveland. We do, we do, and it just it kind of scares me a little bit, just because they, I know they remember as well. So it's like, you know, are they going to come in? the The crazy thing, the peculiar thing about the Chargers is that they can come out and just absolutely smack smack the crap out of somebody. Uh, they just beat the Ra- the the Raiders twenty six to ten, and 
we seen what happened with us last week against the Raiders. So by no means, guys, and, and, you know, we'll definitely dive into this more on our preview show later on this week, but by no means don't count the charges out of this. Do not do not think that this is just going to be an easy game and we can roll over them. And at this point this year, there's pretty much looking at the schedule further down the line, there's really not any games that we could just roll over anymore. That was, that was towards the beginning. That was towards the beginning of the schedule. But, yeah, we, we're in the dogfight, I think, for the rest of the year. So this Chargers game will be very interesting, especially since they just beat the Raiders, who we lost to. Absolutely. Um, the fact of the matter is I do think that the Cleveland Browns couldn't have and could have a good game. The Chargers look a little off this year, which is strange because – if I remember correctly, weren't they the ones that were favored to win the West before uh, I ain't going into the season? I mean, they're always favored to do something, especially when you have a quarterback like Phillip Rivers that can toss up video game numbers. I oh. mean, they, they've had talent all over the place, but at the same time, this has been a team that has been disappointing and some a team that you haven't been able to count on um, in previous years, you know, so – they're just one of those weird squads, man. You just don't know who you're going to get. Again, I think a lot of people pegged the Raiders to win this game against the Chargers, especially seeing after the Raiders put up that many points against us. And then all of a sudden they, they just put up 10 points. So it's going to be very interesting. And like I said, I'm very excited for our preview show coming up. But I kind of want to bask a little bit more in our victory right now. Absolutely. And, uh, because we don't, we don't, we haven't had many of them, and hopefully we can get many more down the line. Oh, real quick before we go, so a quote came out from Demarius Randall saying that if we were able to keep this core together, he could see us, the Browns, bringing home a Super Bowl championship within the next two to three years. How do you feel about that, man? You know, I want to say that it's great. I want to say that it's awesome. I want to say all of this stuff. Let's focus on on right now, though. Let's get the wins now. Let's focus on the wins right now. Let's focus on just getting somewhere in the near future. It's cool. I understand we want to talk about in the next two years. Let's focus on at least improving for, and now first. This is the time to do so. Not in, I mean, not coming up next year. Not in two years. Let's focus on the progression right now. It's a good, it's a good saying, but we also have to remember Terrell Pryor and in that year that we had one win. He said after I believe it was the Giant game. Oh, I believe we could win the rest of the games the, and from here on out. I'm not going to buy into the hype right now. Fair enough. Fair enough. And you know what? It just popped in my head, man. But I think I think to close out this show, because it's been so, so long, we should actually close it out with a little tidbit from Hugh Jackson and his victory speech. All righty. So, Hugh, play us out, buddy. Play us out. Go Browns. Go Browns! You are becoming something special, I'm telling you. If you guys will keep working and do what we're asking you to do, great things are going to happen. You guys broke another streak today. We got to win in the division! Come here, man. Hey, when we talk, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? I tell you, going to make a kick to win the... Game, and that's, that's what you right. did. I'm proud of you. Hey. I'm proud of you. Hey. My man Joseph. Hey. hey, on a serious note, I appreciate y'all rallying me after I was down. But this game ball goes to the whole PAT field goal unit. Not just hey. oh my God. Listen to me. I'm going to give one more out. Come here, Baker. Yep. Yeah! Bank money! What's up, Zay? Scared money don't make money. I ain't been around you a long time. One thing I know about you, you don't flinch. Mm -hmm. You keep playing and you keep bringing the guys with. You got to keep doing that for this football team. You got me? Okay.